who has a 100 word summary of the trouble you guys got into last week? We did. Uh, we had an episode of Town Upkeep, followed by uh, McDole like almost getting the better of everybody, but uh, Dessel saving the day at the very last minute with a, with like a level three spell slot. Yeah, it's one of those spells that you're forced to be have prepared because of your domain. You think you'll never use. <laughs> like, why would I cast that over Fireball? Like none of us ever thought about. Uh... You know what? You are casting a distressingly small amount of fireballs this campaign. I haven't thrown a fireball at anything. We're liter literally fighting once. Uh, let's. Well, we're going to a place where a fireball might be helpful. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine some fireball adjacent scenarios for this map. And then we decided we're going to check out the water situation next, and now we walk through the mist to another place, and we've got to, to take care of... Uh... We met some very well-adjusted people who are clearly very happy about their situation in life. They have dynamite for some reason. Exactly, they're clearly well-adjusted people that are very happy with their lot in life. I don't remember the name of the uh, the NPC we're going to see. My notes Squelter are on the other Lord. side. The Squelter Lord, yes. My notes are on the other side of the room. But do not call him that to his face. No, yeah. I have it written down in my book. Hang on one Ah! I always tell myself I'm going to be better. I'm, I, like, I'm sitting there like just like putting my fist in my hand going, I'm going to be better about taking notes in D&D, &D, and that is always a big, fat... Lie. Lord Brandis, Randis, is, but... Brandis is his name, according to what I've written down. Of course. Am I right, Brandis? Do we remember Brandis what... Brandis with an R. Do we remember what the, uh, what the Squelter Lord sent that one guy to the tree for? He told us. I just don't remember, because, again, notes are... He had not told my you thing. That the Squelcher Lord was looking to expand his domain to the south. Is that where we are? That is where you are. That's where the tree was. Mm. Obviously, the only way to secure our realm is to get rid of the Squelcher Lord. So you met up with... Get rid of the dome, if the dam, I guess, for now. You met up with Docs, Clarence, and Selshin. Uh, three men who are looking to blow up the Squelcher Lord's dam with dynamite. So you just want to do that and go home? I'm like, we can call this session right now. Uh, Hold I mean, on, I have... You keep telling us... Fireballs, that... does that do it? <laughs> you keep telling us the Squelcher Lord is worse than Denny, so... I, I suspect the Squelcher Lord, <laughs> if I play him... Because I haven't introduced him yet, so technically I can do whatever I want with him. But if I play him to the degree that I have in my notes, I think he might be the most unpleasant NPC I've ever designed. I, I feel like we owe it to the DM to let him try. I feel like I already have a reputation for all of my NPCs being assholes. <laughs> It's just you projecting. It's just me projecting, right? It's just my natural personality. I have resting bitch personality. <laughs> I was about to say the same thing, but I was in the other room getting a banana. <laughs> you we, always we just... the best parts of the banter because you're off getting bananas. I so there are. Why that's so funny. Sorry. Approaching the dam, there are two uh, watchtowers near to the dam. There's one up here in the north. There's one down here. In the south, and each one looks to be manned by, uh, difficult to tell at a distance as you're approaching, and the three men you're traveling with don't know. But just looking at it, each of these watchtowers, given the size of the dam, both of them overlook the lake on the other side, you wouldn't be surprised if there was a half dozen to a dozen men in each one. So, are you three gentlemen... Like, it's three people, right? Yes, three men. Okay. Uh, are you three gentlemen, like, on, like... I don't know, wanted list? Are these soldiers going to attack you on site? Or do they just not know who you are? They probably don't know who they are. Okay. These guys are nobodies that... The Squelcher Lord basically chewed up and spit out. The men-at-arms... Uh, 
as you're approaching, as you're noticed by the men up in the watchtower, each one carrying the red and yellow check banner of the Squelcher Lord. Uh, oh, we need to get a banner. Hanging on either side. You have one. Saul has designed you one. I've seen it. No, but we're not carrying... We're not carrying, like, a banner. Oh, well, that we, I can't help you with. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, we need to get, like, a banner that we can carry. Well, we have yeah, three we people. One of them could surely be our standard bearer. We need, we need like, a ta We need tabards. That's what we need. I have a tabard. Yeah, but it's not the colors of your house. It's the colors of your church. Yeah. But as you approach, a couple of men-at-arms uh, emerge from the southern watchtower, which is the one you're closer to. They step out to join you. They've seen you from a good several hundred feet off. You guys are coming uh, up this very slight incline as the trickle of water is rushing down to your right. Once you get in range... One of them calls out. Hello there. Coming north for the wedding. How did you know? I slap Victor in the back of the head. Victor. Please. What? Listen, I know it was supposed to be a surprise, but they've seen us. And he calls down again. Very well. Come forth. Present your invitations. We absolutely, totally, definitely have. Of course we have invitations. Why else okay. are we here? I say we I say I see uh Evie marches forward and says, I I, I don't need an invitation, I'm the Duchess, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and so forth. Does so we, we there's there's two things we could take. We could do that, which is definitely a viable option, or we could say that we're here because we found his dude that he sent scouting in the tree, the dude that was dead talking about Lord Randis. We could say we couldn't bring him use of that guy. Either way. Well, the man's waiting. I'm just going to nudge Evie forward. No, no, Victor broke this situation. Now I have to fix it? Yeah, you're the boss. Exactly. That's what being the boss totally. means. Uh, this, is what it, this is what it's like to be Ruby. Show off your inner Ruby. I like how every week, Evie's discovering that all over again. As though it's the <laughs> first time. That's her, that's her Ravenloft curse. She's got that uh... new flavors of terrible every day. Every every day, new flavors of bad. <laughs> uh, greetings. We come from the duchy to the south. Uh, we have n news of one of uh, Lord Randis's men. Duchy oh. to the south. Thought there were werewolves to the south. You see the uh, man there turns. were werewolves. And for the next few seconds, he's having a conversation with somebody you can't see in the tower behind him. He turns back. Well, approach. Present your invitations. Uh, so we are unfamiliar with this territory. We only just recently learned that there was actually... Are you going to have this full conversation standing 100 feet away from this guy down the hill? Oh, well, I mean, I don't have an invitation to show him. Right. Let's, let's, just, let's just go up. Okay. Yeah, let's just approach. Yeah, we'll approach. They're not gonna. They're, they're not immediately gonna pull weapons, right? I mean, this man already has a weapon. He's leaning on his pike, but he doesn't look. He's, he's not. In a, he's not in a state of hostility. It's just this is his okay. job. All right. Well, these uh, we'll, we'll squares push. are five feet. Uh, yes, these are five foot squares. Sorry, I had business over in the tunnel. Yeah. Did it involve D fours falling on the floor and you stepping on them? No, it involved me needing a book that I didn't have. Ah. So which where these trees are on the map, you can imagine uh, there's a watchtower there. The dam itself is a good almost 15 feet tall in places. And there's not really much to its construction when you get close enough to it. It is literally just what it looks like. A dam made of broken trees and logs and everything. The watchtower stands about 10 feet higher than the dam itself. So a man up on the parapets of the watchtower could look over the lake as well as down the hill where you guys approached from. So wooden watchtower here. There's another one 
just up here kind of off the map. So the man's there with his pike, and you know there are more men behind him. The open door into the watchtower, you can see the flicker of torchlight inside. I guess I'll move towards him. We do not have invitations, but I would request an audience with Lord Randis, should he have availability, of course. So you're not here for the wedding, then? No. We could be. Well, are you or aren't you? You all know one's invited us yet. Well, if you haven't been invited, you're not here for the wedding, then, are you? Well, we didn't know there was a wedding. Victor. <laughs> now we do. Please don't mind our cousin. He's He was dropped on his head as a child, like, several times. Just bounced right down the stairs. Landed on his weird-shaped head every single I step. I told you I wasn't his, dropped. I was thrown. He raises his chin a little bit and squints his eyes. Uh, yeah, it's kind of flat on the top. Yeah. So allow me to introduce myself. I am the Duchess of New Warren, the new duchy that has been established by order of Aslan Rex himself. I have come to make introductions to Lord Randis and bring news of one of his men that we found in our territory who had come to a bad end. And he looks, cranes his head and looks at the three men behind you. Which of them is it? Oh, it's none of them. They're our servants. Victor kind of rubs the top Which of his head. Dilshan says, the hell we are. Don't mind them, they're belligerent. Victor, you're doing that thing again. You say the Duchess of Warren? Warrensville? New Warren. Well, I'll tell you this. Lord Randis would never let a servant talk to him like that. And no mistake. What's next? So if we were to find Lord Randis, where would we go look? He tells you that Gopher Guard Keep is about three days' journey to the north uh, along the river. But he expects that the Lord and all of his servants and everybody in his village will be preoccupied with preparations for the wedding. So is, who's getting married? Uh, oh, it's the uh, the son of the the Lord Michaels uh, is marrying. I don't know, some harlot or some tart. I couldn't imagine. Who's Lord Michaels? I don't don't know the boy's name, and I haven't served his father, but one of the Marsher lordlings to the north, I believe. I don't know why Randis has taken an interest, but it's not for me to gainsay. Well, have you heard anything interesting? Shrugs, I didn't get an invitation, if that's what you mean. Well, oh, surely the people talk about what's going on. To tell the truth, we were informed there would be a wedding and there might be passers-by coming up the river. But nobody comes up the, well... You wouldn't really call it a river, I suppose, he says, looking at the small trickle behind you. <laughs> Maybe a brook. Maybe we're in brook territory. Uh-huh. So in other words, if we were to travel towards Gopher Guard Keep, it wouldn't necessarily look unusual and no one's going to trouble us. He thinks about it for a moment. He says, Mike could be, I could send a runner north. Tell them to expect the, the Duchess of Warrensville. New Warren. That's what I said. I'll look at him and say, that's one. And then he waits expectantly. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so if you could afford Lord Arandis that uh, the Duchess of New Warren would request an audience with his grace. Yeah, I might could do. Yeah. 
And he waits expectantly. He wants to be paid. <laughs> uh, well, he nudges over and says that to her. Yeah. What would be the proper payment for this kind of service? Don't ask him that. Just he, give him silver. He stands up straight. He says, well, I'm Lord Randis' good and loyal man. I couldn't accept payment from passers-by on the road, especially not a duchess. Wouldn't be proper. And then he waits expectantly. <laughs> okay, you have a good afternoon then. And I uh, <laughs> grab Evie and turn her around and start to to lead her north. Vic Victor quietly informs the three in the back when they're not in earshot of the guard to play the part if they want their revenge. So, when Stilshin and Docs start having a little squabble with you on the subject, the issue is that Stilshin is of the mindset like, hey, we're here, we have sticks of dynamite, this guy throws fireballs, what are we waiting for? Where Docs is like, yeah, if we do that, men are going to come streaming out of these two towers and poke us all to death with spears. Yeah. The man at arms that you were talking to can't hear the conversation. You guys are kind of speaking in this little huddle, but he can tell that there's some sort of commotion. But he's just leaning on his pike and kind of watching with bemused interest. You can tell this is a man who spends a lot of days just looking at an empty lake. Mm -hmm. uh, I will like explain. I'm going to explain. Let me explain a couple things to you. One, I don't know if you have enough dynamite to do even any damage to this two if you blow it up it is going to cause a great rush of water that will probably wipe out our home and i don't want that two i mean well three uh they will just rebuild it and then you'll have accomplished nothing and four, do you want to blow up the dam, or do you want to stick a dagger in Randis's neck? Please do not say that out At loud. That, Stilshin is about to respond until Genie says, don't say that out loud. At which point, Stilshin clams up. But you can tell that he likes the idea. <laughs> Alright, so if we continue on past here, is anyone going to stop us? The guard's going to try to give us any trouble, or can we just be on our way? The men in the North Watchtower might step out and ask a few questions of you, but you get the sense that... These guys are stationed way out in the boonies. Mm -hmm. This dam is obviously a valuable asset to Randis, but there doesn't seem to be much challenge to his power in the southern regions of his borders. These guys are just kind of complacent, and they just watch this empty lake for days and days in a row. You can put that to the test if you want to start chucking dynamite, though. It's not, I, I start chucking dynamite. Yeah, I don't think blowing up the dam right now is the move. Because that's just going to provoke him. You know, we don't know what kind of military he has. Apparently everyone's real busy right now. We might be able to mingle. I mean, I'm just going to point out, I have forgery kit. If we want invitations to this wedding, it is possible that I could furnish that. I mean, you're a visiting. Oh, you're a visiting we would people. also need to know what the what an actual invitation looks like to get that correct. Well, we could kidnap a traveler on the way. Let's I mean, politely ask to see somebody else's invitation. Yeah, I'm in favor of just heading towards this keep and seeing what we encounter on the way. I think we should just introduce ourselves and... Yeah, I mean, that's... If, if nothing else, we will go in there and say, I'm the Duchess, I would like to talk to you about this river. Well, we have to remember that, at least according to these three gentlemen, Randis is a big fan of Aslan. So as long as we go in there with the approach of, hey, we're fellow nobles who also serve for Aslan. Isn't he great? I think we'll be welcomed. Like, can we just be walking while we're talking? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Don't want to have this conversation, like, here in front of these guards. Like, we're already weird enough. We don't want... Yeah, I think we're, we're doing this while we're walking, probably. So the guards don't bar your passage at all. Uh, provided none of you try to mess with the dam. So no. I guess the question no. is, which one of you tries to mess with the dam? <laughs> uh, like Edmund, not doing that. Edmund, Edmund's going to go start punching the dam. Yeah, I'm going to werewolf the dam. That's exactly what it's It's a dam happen. mimic. Roll initiative. <laughs> we ain't had one of those yet. <laughs> you know what? Let's, let's tie Edmund up out here next time he wolves out. Uh, the river no. 
that feeds into the lake. And the lake itself is fairly large. So basically you leave this map going off to the west. You curve around the uh, uh, the bridge of the lake to the north, coming around the north bank of it. And uh, by getting on into evening is when you start to find the river that feeds into the lake. And you can see immediately why Randis at this point has decided to dam up this river and keep all the water on his side of the mists is that irrigation channels are feeding off in many different directions from this lake. Uh, one natural river looks to have fed into it, uh, which is now swollen and bulging on either side, which is the story you've heard from Clarence, who lost his home when the river flooded. And yeah, just tracks and tracks of uh, good farmland coming through the middle of autumn now. I mean, their harvest clearly going to be better than yours. So the question of how wealthy or how much influence does Lord Randis have, if he's lord of the entire region up here if all of these the, the farmland you see these homesteads uh are vassals or serfs of his he seems to be quite wealthy indeed i mean new warren's still up and coming we'll get there you guys have like 40 lumberjacks and a ghost boy is he a ghost know, whatever happened to him you haven't dealt with him yet so he's still there <laughs> We have a shepherd and goats now, too. Oh, that's right. You guys do oh, have that's right. I forgot about the... Not really a shepherd. Well, we, have an acolyte, we have an acolyte of air, too. Mm, kind I'm of. Sure He's a con that... man. That's... That makes the best acolyte. That's like all... Isn't That can be said of all religious leaders, so it's fine. <laughs> On the second day, <laughs> you come through a small village, and it's little more than just a couple of buildings. Like, there's an inn at... A crossroads where the the north south road adjoins the east west road in the southerly province of Randis's uh, domain. Uh, little more here than, like I said, just an inn, stables, uh, and some farmland stretching out in any direction. But the roads are well trodden, and as you arrive in the village, uh, it looks like a wedding party a group of attendees is looking to depart the next day. They've had a long overland journey from the West and they've stayed here for a couple of days to just kind of rejuvenate their strength. And just from the murmuring in the village, you learn that the primary guest in this party is the widow Kalaris, uh, an old widowed lady who'd received an invitation. She's here with all of her servants and she has this huge carriage house parked just outside the North. Uh, not really. There's not a gate. There's no wall or anything to this little village, but just parked outside loaded up with her luggage and all of her, uh, her servants and hangers on her, her cooks and her maids and everybody have basically filled this small crossroads in to capacity. This is the scene when you guys arrive at the first village you find. Huh? Do we do we we talk to her? And by we, I mean everyone except may, maybe just me and you, Evie, and I glare at Victor. By everyone, we mean not Victor. Hey, I got it on my own. Victor's already upstairs talking to her. <laughs> She's hitting uh, on the uh, the old widow. <laughs> Ekon will walk up to uh, Evie and say, "Well, I'm sure Air will help you do your best." Pat him on, pat her on the shoulder, and cast enhance ability charisma on her. God knows she needs it. Hey, my charisma's a lot higher than yours. Okay, Ruby. Hey, stop. Like, we don't need her, like, going into the existential crisis when we're on a job. I think that given the description of Randis, maybe she needs to embrace her inner Ruby. I mean... You'll know she's... And to be clear, I am still casting the morning, uh... 
lesser restoration on Victor every day, right? Oh, I should hope so. Otherwise, Victor is going to die. Okay. Or turn to chaotic evil, one of the two. No, you're going to die. No, I can just ask for help. Okay, so this inn is at capacity, is what I'm hearing. It's filled up with her servants and cooks and whatnot. I mean, the inn is basically uh, a small extended family owns and operates the place, and they're getting they're kind of overwhelmed with travelers at the moment. This is a fairly large wedding party from somewhere off west. I think we should introduce ourselves to the to, uh, the widow. She might be able to get us into the party without causing too much of a stink. Or maybe, you know, she would let us know if it's ma a major faux pas to show up and be like, Hey, what's up? You having a wedding? We're the, we're the Southern Duchess. We're the, we're the Veritas. <laughs> we're the Veritas? We're the Veritas. Yo, we bring the, the Veritas. And then that just should be the banner. Signs. Just stark white banner and then printed in like a serifed font. We're the Veritas. Period. That's our title, title, though. I'm glad you understand. Throw, throw sure. some gang signs. Going into this small crossroads inn, uh, it's, it's a commons room, and then two doors exit from the commons. One goes off into the kitchens, one goes off into what you presume would be the deck guest quarters. Right now, it looks as though the old dowager lady is in the commoner's wooden, and she is a sight. She is well past her prime, and she is wearing this tall, very subtly lilac-colored powdered wig. We're talking, like, Marge Simpson hair. And she is wearing just globs of makeup. Her face looks white as a sheet. She's wearing this big, ostentatious gown and she's sitting at this wooden table in the center of the common room just kind of regarding everybody with a bored and distant contempt while fanning herself victor grabs evie's arm and in a slightly too loud voice says oh my god her hair is amazing other people in this room uh you can't difficulty telling which ones are her servants and which ones are the servants of the inn. They're all just kind of running around, uh, going about their day's labors. Two people that catch your eye. Uh, one is a man sitting at the dowager's table with her. A very young fop of a man. With this billowing uh, orange hair coming out the top and sides of his head. And he, too, is wearing just way too much makeup. The other is a woman who's not sitting, but she's standing near to a table on the side of the room, kind of keeping an eye over everything. And it's difficult to get a read on her visage because she's wearing thick hooded robes. Even inside, she has her cloak clasped about her and pulled down over the top head of her top part of her face. You can't see her eyes or her hair. It looks like she would be a traveler on the road, but typically people come inside, they set aside their walking sticks and hang up their cloaks. And this woman has not done that. I'm going to uh, grab uh, Evie's shoulder and then like, and just whisper, I'll, I'll go introduce you. Okay. I'm going to uh, walk up to the table and make a ahem noise in my throat. It's like I am Jeannie Veritas, sister to the uh, Duchess Lady uh, Evelyn Veritas. And we are in the area and my sister would like to speak with you. As you approach the table, the young man stand, sitting at the table stands up a little too abruptly. A little uncanny valley he gets to his feet. And he clears his throat. It's, well, it's a pleasure to have made your acquaintance, ladies Jeannie and Evelyn. I have the pleasure to be Dexter, manservant of, and he gestures down, of the Lady Yvonne Kalaris. Lady Yvonne has not stopped fanning herself. She simply says, Charmed. 
Mm. Meanwhile, back at the door, uh, Edmonds and Ekin, you're approached by mm-hmm. what you presume to be one of the, uh, a teenage boy, who you presume to be one of the family that runs the inn, just apologetically, a little bit out of breath about how there's no spare rooms, about how the Lady Kolaris has uh, filled the place up. Like, if if you're looking to stay the night, they can have maybe prepare a space in the stable for you. Oh, we'll be all right camping outside of the village if it comes to that. We're part of the retinue of uh, the Duchess Evelyn. Uh, the Duchess Evelyn? Oh, I'll seven nod over across. towards my cousin. Gods be good. Yeah. He curses under his breath and he turns from you and he flees back into the kitchens. What is... I think we made his life terrible. You can't let a duchess sleep in the stable. What is Victor doing, I'm afraid to ask? <laughs> Aside from commenting on <laughs> Yvonne's hair. Um... So you've approached the lady with Jeannie and Evie. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> I feel like I should say yes, but I'm going to say no. Okay, so what are you and Ekin and Edmund? All right, so look, Victor is going to kind of make his way around the inn and try and get an idea of the various conversations going on and who might be who. Okay. Make me a charisma investigation check. And what are Ekin and Edmund going to do while the twins are speaking with the lady? Um, I think I'm just going to watch the room. I don't really have anything I need to accomplish right now. You're going to do yeah, that from, with from the door, from the entrance? Is there space in there just for somebody to come in and uh, sit down? Uh, there's nowhere for you guys to sit down. In fact, it looks like they've dragged tables from some of the other outlying houses to facilitate the lady's large entourage. But there's definitely standing space next to the door. You wouldn't be blocking a fire exit or anything. Um, so, Brick, in... I'm good with that. In tradition of Victor and his amazing personality, that's a five. A five. Excellent. So, speaking with the lady, uh, the twins ar- arrive, they approach, they introduce themselves... And the lady's manservant kind of shoes away two of the other men sitting in a nearby table, drags their chairs over to the lady's table, and motions down for you two to sit. Maybe you'll take a seat. I'll sit on her right, I guess. And after both of you two sit down, he pulls a handkerchief out of his pocket and dabs a glob of uh, makeup away from each eye and sits down and folds his hands neatly in his lap. Only at that point does the lady speak again. So you have come for this shambles of a wedding, I imagine. Uh, Well, in truth, we have business with Lord Randis, but we have heard that there is a wedding. Are you on your way there? Oh, I wouldn't miss it. I have heard that the invitations are actually quite exclusive. And she gives a very polite chuckle at that. Exclusive. I shouldn't think the squelcher lord even knows how many have been sent out. I expect he's invited half the realm. Really? I see that I'm not well informed of the goings on in these parts of the land. Uh, Tell me, um, where is it that you have come from? And she gives the name of her holdfast far off to the west. Uh, and she immediately follows up. And says, Did you know that the bride-to-be was supposed to be warded at my keep? As a young really, girl many years ago. How did that arrangement fall through? Well... When Lord Randis has his eyes set on something, one can hardly get in his way. Isn't that correct, Dexter? 
To which the manservant replies, Oh, of course, my lady, as you say. So, Lord Randis had designs on this young lady himself? Such a droll and unladylike topic. You'll notice that I don't have an ear for gossip, my darling. But enough about me. I haven't heard of this House Evelyn? She leans forward questioningly. Oh, and uh, Evie will begin to you know explain how we were recently you know granted title in the lands of the south by aslan rex himself with the intention of you know restoring Gee, the land back insight to... check uh, okay you said genie genie all right evie you can continue uh let's see that is a oh we can all see what Eight. it is that's 18 that's a big die it's 18 Hey, if you just say we we were awarded this land by you know Aslan Rex, and we're tr tr currently in the process of setting three. We've been basically living in the wilderness for the past several months, and it's kind of nice to be able to see civilization for the first time in a while. Oh, my poor girls! What a nightmare that must be for you. She cranes her head and looks to the door. It says, "Yes, your servants look like weary and road trodden things." Genie. Yep. You've yep. seen Evie drop Azel and Rex's name a few times now. You have yet to see it impress anybody. And sure enough, the lady Kalaris does not seem impressed either. Mm -hmm. yeah, he doesn't seem to have much sway in this part. But she has just called Ekin and Edmund your servants. Uh, and I'll speak up and say, ah, oh, those are our cousins. You've made and, servants of your cousins. Well, and I one of our see brothers. The appeal, I suppose. They couldn't, in good conscience, betray their blood, could they? Jeannie, like, looks up. And she thinks about Victor. <laughs> <laughs> Victor. You're kind of mulling around the room trying to catch snippets of conversation, but right. whatever they're saying is, like, as you approach each uh, small group of people, their their conversations come to a halt. They regard you suspiciously. That's what I do if Victor came up to me too. He he offers his award winning smile. Now you don't win any awards in this inn. With that five, he wins something. So you make polite small talk with primarily with the ladies' servants, but also with a couple members of the family that runs the inn. Speaking of which, after another moment or so, a very fat and very dirty man who smells remarkably like fish comes out of the kitchen, mopping his sweaty brow with a dirty cloth, approaching the table. And as he does, you see the dowager push her chair back and lean back, and her fan picks up pace a little bit. And the man approaches a hundred apologies at a time. Please accept my apology, Lady Evelyn. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, quarter you and your servants. He'll look around. Eh, it seems you are doing a brisk business, sir. He exchanges a glance with the, the lady that is not returned. Says, well, as you say, uh, we'll do our best to make you and yours comfortable. I understand you're traveling north for the wedding. Uh, we have business with Lord Randis. He says, uh, well, we've just served the midday meal, but if you like, I can have something brought out for you and your men. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And he hollers back for bread and cheese to come forth, and he disappears. And when he does, the lady leans back into the table, and her fan slows down. So, uh, Lady, uh, what is her name? Lars. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Lady, I forgot the name already. Alaris. Alaris. So, he Lady whispers it into your ear. Alaris. Uh, it's almost so, Lady Alaris. I I do notice that uh, 
You do not uh, seem all that impressed by the name uh, Aslan Rex. Is he not well regarded here? She rolls her eyes. Aslan Rex is a how to put it a scary sorcerer, a mythological figure. Uh, Dexter no, nods. He's he's not. We've met him. He's terrifying. I'm sure you have, darling. She reaches forward and gives you a condescending pat on the hand. Yep. Interesting. S scary Wizard King is an understatement. As you're describing your meaning with Azel and Rex, Dexter, the manservant, smiles. And by the end of your description, you almost think he's bouncing in his seat a little bit. Interesting. Okay, I think he's the angle we need to pursue because he seems real into it. And I, I'm, I'll share uh, a look with him. And do you have something you would like to add? And how old does he look? Is it difficult to tell because maybe of the Orson's makeup? age or so? How? Uh, what about you, young man? Do you have something to add? Young man says the eighteen-year-old to the fifteen-year-old. I mean, just about the time you're starting to question Dexter. The cloaked woman from the side of the room steps forth and leans forward. Uh, my lady, I've been told that the leeches are prepared for you. At which point, the dowager uh, takes her leave of you. And she heads back into the guest quarters with the cloaked woman. Okay, so I have to ask, when we hear leeches, do we think, oh, medicine? Or do we think, these people are crazy? Do you ask Dexter? No, I'm like, is uh, the level of medicine in Fernisco, is that beyond where they use leeches for medicine? I mean, leeches have their use. Yeah. Uh, what use are the no, leeches? No, leeches are a legitimate medicine thing, especially at this technology level. So, so what's the deal with leeches? You don't make a medicine Jeannie check. Ask. Me? Yeah. Oh, I don't have medicine. Well, then you can't make the check. Jeannie, do you have it? No. Okay. The only one of us that has medicine is Ekon. Like, I'm, not even, I'm not even sure if like the archaic practice of bloodletting would be widely known in the Republic where you're from. Right. So, but I mean, I'll just ask him. So what what's with the leeches? He seems so friendly. And he he peppers down some. So, oh uh, well, my lady and I sometimes. You know how it is when one... The yellow bile comes out of balance and must be oh, purged. Yes. Evie nods, even though she has no idea what that means. I have no idea what you mean. Oh, but I do love stories about Azalyn Rex. My nanny used to tell me so many when I was a child. So has he just never been up here? Is that why he's considered... Like a boogeyman? I heard a story once where he was pursuing a young wizard girl, but she was too clever and she outfoxed him at every step. So he called his friend a vampire king to collect her for him, except, oh, and this is my favorite part, the vampire king fell in love with the young wizard girl, drank of her blood, and she became a vampire. And in doing so, lost her wizardly powers, and thus Aslan Rex had no more interest in her. See, that's a great story, because it has the romantic element that becomes a tragedy. Uh, I bet they're not friends anymore. <laughs> Who's not friends anymore, darling? Oh, the, the vampire. The, and Aslan Rex. <laughs> yeah. Azalyn struck, struck me as the kind of person who would hold oh. a grudge. <laughs> I, you silly. They're just stories. Look me in the eye as I tell you this. We met Azalyn Rex, and he is terrifying. Make a perception check. <laughs> Looking him right in the eye. Uh, that is a... Ten. Something about his eyes are unnerving. You can't put your finger on what, but you meet his gaze, you ask him to look right in the eye, and you find that you don't want to hold this man's gaze for more than a few moments, and you turn away. Evie will kind of lean in and be like, would you like to hear what his castle's like? Edmonton Ekin. 
Mm -hmm. After a few moments, you're watching them have this conversation. Some of the servants from the inn come around with small wooden platters of this morning's bread and a hunk of cheese for each of you. I'll take it gracefully. Yeah. And a hunk of cheese and a piece of bread for each of the, uh, the three men with you as well. Stilshin starts munching, and he has an enormous smile on his face the whole time. You can see that he's starting to aggravate Docs. But the three men are taking your leave. They're just kind of hanging back by the door, waiting, watching the room. At some point, Docs leans in and whispers to Ekin and Edmund. We're standing in the Crossroads Inn, and Stilshin... I'm sorry, no, Clarence. And Clarence still has in his pack... He looks down at Clarence's pack. If you take my meaning. I'm well aware. Did one of them have a grudge against Crossroads Inn? Not as far as you know. Okay. I was just always thinking, I don't remember that. <laughs> Maybe make measures to make sure that it's not tampered with or stolen. Do we have a bag of holding right now? Yes. I made a permanent one. Yeah, well, we can't. We don't have access to you right now. <laughs> like it's a, I'll, uh, I'll it's, nod to him and say, "We'll we'll have uh, Jeannie take care of it. She's good at that sort of thing, keeping things out of sight and untampered with." Edmund grabs a dynamite and just takes it up to Jeannie's table and puts all the sticks into the bag of holding one by one. No, not going to do that. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna call for Jeannie. Get it. Uh, catch her attention. And I'm going to, uh... You're going to what? I'm going to, uh, one... I'll, I'll just motion for one second, and then I'll write a note. And then rip off the paper and hand it to, uh, Evie. And, uh, get up and go see what, uh... What Edmont says. The note says something weird about his eyes. Hmm. <laughs> So yeah, Evie, then... you just trade boogeyman stories. Oh yeah, he's got three castles and one. There's, like, there's lightning in his walls. Yeah, there's lightning in the walls. It was always really cold. like Not like cold, like there's skeletons, just like it's cold. It was weird. So you should enjoy a plate of cold bread and cheese and a mug of ale. I think Evie prefers wine. They don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. Does uh do do they let me put the their bag into my bag? They do, but the only man of the three who seems happy with the arrangement and happy is an overstatement is Docs. Docs seems indifferent. Clarence and Selshin. Uh, you get some pushback from them, but they also realize that they don't have a lot of say in the matter. I mean, so in taking their explosives, you've made them unhappy, but they're not going to prevent you from doing it. Uh, I'll give it back to you when we get back on the road, if that makes you happier. Just don't want to get caught out here in, in the town with it. It's not even a town, though. I thought it was just like a... Oh, Wayside Inn. Yeah, this is barely a, a village. It's. It looks like at one point it was just this family's plot of farm, and they just had a lot of travelers from each direction. They just built up an inn here. So, the key piece of information to take away from the meeting, unless you guys have more designs on Dexter or the Lady Kalaris, is she's going to be departing the next morning to head mm -hmm. north. There's another two days of travel. Uh... They expect to stay at one more village along the way. The Lady Clarice has no interest in camping. I have Maybe. one question for Dexter. Oh, and then if McDowell wants to go first, he can. No, go ahead. Uh, the only question I have for Dexter is, do you think that the, uh, the Lord uh, will be upset if we show up? Do you think they would even notice? <laughs> the Squelcher Lord, you mean? Uh, we... Well, sure. far be it for me to say 
But the Lady Calaris always says that if you make Lord Randis feel important, that is the... And he searches for the words for a moment. The key to his heart is his ego. Ah, we have one person that is very good at making people feel smart. So we should be fine there. So what do you guys do after you have lunch? Edmund, you had something? I was gonna say perhaps we perhaps we suggest to the uh to the lady that we uh travel together, safety and numbers and all that. Well she's in getting leached right now. Yeah, I mean once that once she is no longer being leached. I mean, do you pass the word along with some of her servants or something? Yeah, they'll raise the point with Dexter then. Okay. So do you guys hang out at the inn for the rest of the day? I mean, after having a meal, I don't think I have any particular business here. I might head back. I mean, are they trying to put us up or are we just going to camp outside of town? Well, they, they say that they can probably make a comfortable place for you in the stables, if need be. They can make sure that you're fed. They'll make sure to bring down uh, a tub of water and a kettle if you need it. But they just don't have any physical space in the building for a party of your size. Are you going to go proselytize air while you're here? No. Nah. So what we could use this time for is... yeah. What can I do to make us like presentable for a wedding? Well, where's this have... conversation taking place? Are we Probably still... out... Out of the stable, probably. So you guys are back out near, near to the stables now. You find a yep, quiet place. Regroup. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when is the... Uh, I wouldn't dig into that, but I'll deal with it. Well, we're in travel clothes. <laughs> yeah. we didn't, none of us have noble clothes like in our packs at the moment, I don't think. Uh, I do I do have one more question. When is the actual date of the wedding supposed to be? There's probably not a fixed date. It's... Lord Randis will declare the wedding starting once the guests have arrived. So once enough important people are in the vicinity of the people who are to be wed, that's probably when the wedding will begin. Okay. I think it might be a good idea for us to get there before the wedding starts. Maybe we can catch him, you know, before. And not interrupt the, 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 the celebration with I think he's going to be politics. too busy. As you guys are having this conversation around the side of the stable, the cloaked woman from the inn approaches you. As she does. And this is where everybody's thinking, wait a minute, did Burko tell us that story about his friend who always had the super important magical girl in his Raven Flot story? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't, you can't mention that. No. Oh, God. It's okay. I have to it in the editing. He ruined his plans. By the way, I'm not going to identify this poor kid by name. <laughs> that would be that would be wrong of me. But I do love telling stories. Uh, no, she approaches. Victor will look up from his moping about how nobody wants to talk to him. Well, she doesn't want to talk to you either, so she don't want to hear it. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, she says, which of you is Edmont? Edmont lifts a hand. Ah, well met, sir. I... You sent word that perhaps you will be traveling with our lady's entourage to the wedding. I'd merely drop the suggestion. And if I may ask, what are you to Lord Randis? Neighbors. None of you are wearing... I mean, uh, Ekin is probably the only one who's wearing anything that could be described as finery, because you're always wearing your yeah, your nice armor. Okay. Well, it was nice. Remember, he scraped all the gold off in the tree. <laughs> I'm yeah, assuming Ekin nice. works to keep his armor looking nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Evie has a nice outfit in her pack, probably. You're not wearing I it I used moment. to have a nice outfit no. in my pack, and then our horses got stolen. No. Evie's wearing, like, riding clothes. That was like six months ago. You haven't replaced those yet. At what no, point have we in... had a chance? We've been in Ravenloft! <laughs> Where exactly am I supposed to be <laughs> replacing gonna, these? Gonna take a trip out of the tailor real quick. In yeah, the middle just, of yeah. The just hire a seamstress, take her back to your oh. village for, with you. I mean, Where? I can make you clothes. 
Where? Brick Road. So Edmund, you tell the woman, uh, you basically answer yes to her question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At this point, she reaches up and she pulls her hood back. And she has raven black hair. And for a moment, you think she's wearing a crown or a tiara or something that was underneath the hood of her cloak. But you realize, possibly with a moment of horror, that there are horns curling off from her brow. Yeah, that, 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 that causes Edmont to go a little uh, is... wide-eyed. And her Ooh. eyes are monstrous. Does Victor see this? Oh, yes. Everybody sees it. You all standing Victor, there. Victor. He has, she has no irises. She has these stark white eyes with just these piercing pinpoints of deep, deep red in the center of them. Victor enthusiastically leaps up and takes a step towards her with wide eyes. Wow. As Victor takes a step towards her, she turns to the side slightly so that her walking stick is in between the two of you. Probably smart. She I says. Ed Edmont stumbles a little bit, like, like clearly taken off guard by her appearance. That's amazing. What, what are those horns? Don't he be rude, Victor. Kind of, he says this kind of quietly. Yeah, that's kind of kind of rude. <laughs> Uh, forgive my cousin. He we've never seen uh, somebody with horns before. Oh no, I'm quite used to it. Do you know what these horns do, young man? Uh, besides, look amazing. No, I have no idea. At that, she gestures with her left hand, basically to every magic item or piece of equipment you all are carrying that radiates magic, and she says they detect dangerous things in the vicinity of my lady. So, like, Victor's, uh, or Evie's knife, and you guys got a bunch of weird magic stuff. Edmund's wearing a ring. Uh, my current infusions are two daggers and uh, the ring. Yeah, and everything and I've got, in my ring. Uh, and I've also got I've the got bag. A continual flame diamond in my bag, and uh, Orson has, one, has a necklace with it. Orson you also has two. a magic spear. Yep. And, and yes, has a, has, in has turn, a she points to well. all of this stuff. So she's, and she's addressing primarily Edmund, because he's the one who sent a message in. Says, it's very rare to see travelers, even noblemen, with this amount of dangerous equipment. Well, to be fair, most of it I made. Except for that spear and that spear. And then Ed, and then Ekon made the, 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 the glow. Oh, I've got scrolls too, yeah. Never to be used unless unless your lady means us hostility, which I don't see that happening. Evie says, you know of the Keltastravi? I do. No. We have been embroiled in conflicts with them as of late. I had heard they had been run off. Indeed. That was you. She just... She seems now you know why. <laughs> she says she gestures at all the weapons that they have. I believe I've demonstrated my purpose. But you've not been invited to the wedding. Correct. And Lord Randis, if I may be bold, but it does not seem that he knows you exist. Eh. That's why we're here. 